Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, Sheboygan County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Roger Testrudi. And as you know, every month we strive to bring a different department, department head or a key employee here to talk a little about their role and responsibilities. And today, we have a director of the largest department of our 19 in Sheboygan County, our Health and Human Services Director, Tom Agerbrecht. Tom, welcome. Thanks, Adam. Good to have you here. The Health and Human Services Department not only is the largest uh, with the number of employees, but also has the most significant budget, close to about $31 million. Mm -hmm. So a lot going on, and this should be a real good program to get a feel for what is all happening in Health and Human Services and why is it so important to our community. Uh, Tom, let's start there. Share a little bit about the core services that the Health and Human Services Department provides. Sure. Um, all counties, Adam, in the state as well as other local units of government are charged with certain responsibilities. That includes protection, uh, that includes health promotion, that includes financial assistance for people in need. Many counties might organize those services in different ways. Many counties might have separate departments that provide that assistance. You might have Department of Social Services, Department of Community Programs, Department of Public Health, Office on Aging. In Sheboygan County, a decision was made in 1989 to combine those then separate departments into a unified department delivery. So our Health and Human Services Department in Sheboygan is covering the waterfront in terms of those services. So that includes child protection, juvenile justice, health services, and that includes mental health and AODA treatment. Uh, we provide adult protective services, aging services, and financial services, and we do that in three separate locations. Our main office is on 8th Street across from Fountain Park. Uh, we have an aging and disability resource center uh, located at 650 Forest Avenue in Sheboygan Falls, and economic support is offered through the Sheboygan Job Center, which is at 3620 Wilgus Avenue. So we've got a pretty broad array of services, and that comprises about 181 employees currently. Um, our high water mark with employees was 204. We have 204 authorized on our table of organization, but we'll be entering the new year with 181. And like most units of government, we've tried to do more with less in recent years, and we've got a great staff. I'm very proud of them. You have a wonderful staff, and every now and then I get pulled into some of the uh areas that you and your staff work on and it, it's always sobering to, to learn more about some of the the needs in this community and people hurting in this community mm -hmm. and whether it's dealing with children or child abuse or elderly abuse or or you name it there's so much going on so i appreciate the work that you and your staff do thanks there are four primary divisions are there not mm -hmm. and they are so our divisions include our division of economic support right. and that's what's located at the job center right. We have a division of public health. Right. We have a division of community programs, which provides mental health and AODA treatment, as I mentioned. And then we have a division of social services. So those division titles are kind of reminiscent of the former departments that used to exist that have now come together to create our unified department. And of course, a number of different programs and services associated with each. Mm -hmm. This year, or this past year, where I know we're, we're nearing the end of 2013, but this has been a a very remarkable year, a lot going on, and uh, I know you and, and some of your staff in particular were challenged perhaps like never before. Mm -hmm. Please uh, share with our viewers what was unique about 2013. Yeah, I would say, you know, every year is challenging. Uh, this year was exceptional. Um, one of the things that government is, is adjusting to right now is an aging baby boom population. Uh, growth of entitlement programs and some concerns about how that's all going to be afforded. So in the last year or so, our economic support division had to partner with nine other counties in the region to start delivering services in a new way. We knew that coming into the year. As the state budget was developed and as the Affordable Care Act was played out in the state of Wisconsin, we also became aware of the fact that specific changes were going to occur in terms of how people might gain access to health insurance, 
who would have access to Medicaid, who would go to the private marketplace. So the state budget called upon us to add staff, to expand our services, and so um, we could assist people through that process. So we ended up expanding our hours of work for our employees. We ended up adding limited term as well as regular employees to respond to that. So that was a challenge in and of itself. In the middle of all of that, we also had a TB outbreak that threw us into emergency response mode and that we never saw coming. Uh, that started in April. We had a suspected case of TB that was identified and through our contact investigation, um, that infection was confirmed. Um, and not only did we have a, an active case of TB, we also learned that it was resistant to multiple drugs, which is a very, very difficult circumstance. And with that status, there was potential for transmission to many, many others throughout the community. So as I said, we were adjusting to changes that some of which we knew were coming, some of which we adapted to, and then we got thrown into emergency response mode, which ultimately involved our working with uh, the State Department of Health Services, the Centers for Disease Control. Um, we went through many, many contact investigations with community partners and businesses. Um, we arranged isolation for the active TB where it was found. Um, and worked diligently to try to contain that. And again, at the end of the day, it was a very, very challenging circumstance. We came through it in a good way, but uh, uh, required a lot of exemplary efforts, I would say, on the part of our staff to maintain and, and to contain. Tremendous collaboration. It was, uh, it was just outstanding. And of course, we, the county received uh, nice accolades from the state and federal level about how it was handled here. So kudos to you and your team. It was, it was excellent collaboration. Let's take a step back a little bit. You know, I think most people probably read in the paper, heard on the radio that there was a TB outbreak here, mm -hmm. but we may have some viewers who are wondering, well, what exactly is TB and how do you get TB and why was it here? What's a lay person explanation of what TB is? Well, tuberculosis is a, a respiratory infection. It occurs through um, airborne transmission. Um, and, and when you say many people are not familiar with TB, I think that, that speaks to our healthcare system, our healthcare practices. There was a time in history where TB was a lot more prevalent than it is now. Um, Rocky our, Knoll was our built county as a TB facility, center. Rocky Knoll, is right. a perfect example of that. Rocky Knoll's early history involved. Uh, uh, serving as a sanatorium for persons with uh, TB infection. So again, uh, left untreated, it, it compromises uh, uh, immune systems, it creates lesions within the lungs, and uh, ultimately can lead to death. And so while it has been largely eradicated in this country, it's still out there. It's uh, quite prevalent in other parts of the world. And so um, we unfortunately ended up uh, with some cases of TB this past year that were unexpected. And how large of an outbreak was it? Um, we started out in April uh, with notification of a singular case. This is actually an individual who had sought treatment from a number of uh, healthcare providers for respiratory concerns. And ultimately, uh, she was seeking assistance for depression and one can step back and if you have a health condition that isn't resolving, you can understand how that becomes emotionally draining. At that point, and that contact actually occurred through our new uh, Lakeshore Community Health Center, right. contact was made with our staff, our department, and um, with suspicion raised about uh, possible TB, our nursing staff uh, initiated their own investigation, worked with healthcare partners, and as I said, that case was determined to be multi-drug resistant, and what happens in those circumstances is contact investigations are initiated. Who did that person have contact with, for what period of time, and what context? And there were additional members of that family that were found to have 
uh, TB infection. So that singular case in April grew to as high as 11 suspected cases over the course of the summer. If I recall correctly, the 11th case ended up being ruled out eventually, but 10 solid cases involving TB. Uh, we were working with the uh, Centers for Disease Control and the State Department of Health, as I mentioned, and the modeling uh, around those active cases, particularly with the multi-drug resistant strain, suggested that for every uh, active case, you might expect 15 latent infections. And so what that means is persons who might be carrying uh, the disease, but not in an active state, but still requiring treatment. So if you take that modeling, as was suggested, uh, the 15 cases that we were anticipating could be seen through, through our investigation, and again, it was capped off at 11 at one point, but those 15 cases could have led to another 225 persons requiring treatment. So in the early days of our investigation, as those numbers were growing and growing rapidly, we had feared the worst and had expected that we could have as many as 200 plus individuals with TB infections needing treatment. Right, right. And before I turn it over to Roger, you know, just a point and a shout out to our, our clinic, our Lakeshore Community Clinic, uh, which really just got ramped up about a year ago, maybe mm -hmm. a little more now. Tremendous need in the community. I mm -hmm. think for dental alone, they have a waiting list of around a thousand people. And if, if you can imagine children who have never seen a dentist or are struggling with, with uh, dental needs and, and have no place to go. So they're really providing a valuable resource in the community. And this individual who went there, had she not gone there, had she not received that care and that diagnosis and had someone step up and then refer her to the Health and Human Services Department, we may have seen a, a far more significant outbreak. And you know, for those who aren't real familiar with TB, and I certainly wasn't, I've learned a lot in the last year, uh, if you are multi-drug resistant or if you're really in dire straits with TB, literally it can be months and months and months before you can return, return to a normal you know, lifestyle, mm -hmm. whether you're no longer going to be able to go to school, go to work, what have you, which if you're someone who already is struggling a little bit financially, that's just going to make things that much worse. So a real credit to our new community clinic, a credit to the Health and Human Services Department and your staff. And, and as I pass it on to Roger, of course, there was a lot of collaboration and other good people that stepped up and helped us address this. Thank you, Adam. Uh, as Adam mentioned, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of agencies and people that helped us out. Uh, would you explain to the audience uh, who all was involved and who helped us? Sure, be happy to, Roger. I hope I can remember them all because the, uh, the response and the assistance was, was tremendous. I already mentioned that we had um, great support from the State Department of Health Services, the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, we also put a call out to other regional health departments on the front end. Big shout out goes to Manitowoc County. Manitowoc County Health Department took on our other disease investigation so that our staff could concentrate on TB response. We also had other health departments across the region contacting retired nurses who came on board with us in, in order to help with uh, administration of treatment and containment of the disease. Um, our HR department here in Sheboygan County was tremendous in clearing the hurdles that allowed us to hire those people very, very rapidly. Uh, the county's emergency uh, management director, Steve Steinhardt, played a key role. We actually activated an emergency operations structure, much the way uh, any unit of government might do in a disaster circumstance, whether that be flood or, or fire, tornado, things of that nature. That structure was activated in this circumstance because of the magnitude of what we were dealing with, because of the risks that were involved, and Steve played a key role in helping activate that and coordinate that. Uh, Sheboygan Fire Department was involved and sat at the table with us. They did fit testing for those staff that had to go into homes where uh, therapy was being monitored so that 
proper masks could be worn to protect those workers from contracting the disease. They developed protocols for their staff in the event that any infected individuals would require ambulance transport during a period of infection and how to protect their workers during that circumstance. Um, uh, Sheboygan Police Department assisted us with uh, isolation set up and containment. When we discover active cases of TB uh, that could transmit to others, those individuals are isolated in those circumstances and the uh, police department was tremendously assistive in helping with that. We had Wisconsin emergency management personnel who were there and helping us coordinate the response effort. Our local health care partners, Aurora and St. Nick's Hospital, were tremendous. Uh, big shout out again to Dr. Porcina of the Aurora system. Uh, who, who worked side by side with our staff to arrange treatment and monitor status. And um, even within our department as well, um, collaboration ended up being required in ways that was previously untested. So it started out as a nursing issue, but when you throw in the full magnitude of challenges that were emerging and trying to manage that situation, very, very close collaboration between nurses social workers and accountants needed to happen in order for that effort to be successful. And when they were working separate, you can't accomplish the same amount as you can together. So again, I'm probably forgetting some important people. I can think of Bernie Romer, our city county purchasing agent. Bernie was there to help acquire equipment to arrange housing when we needed to promote isolation to contain the disease. So many, many people, Roger, played a big, big role, and a uh, big shout out to all of them. It's great to hear the cooperation, and uh, I know the Health and Human Services for Sheboygan County has done so well in the past few years in meeting their budget, but there was a financial impact. Could you explain to us how our, uh, our, our local uh, legislators helped us with that? Yeah, with that, that, that too is an important point, and I neglected to mention them, mention them just a moment ago. So in the early days of, of our uh, discovery process, where we were fearing that we could have as many as 15 active cases and those could transmit to another 15 individuals each, um, the fear was that we could have 200 plus individuals infected. When we're talking about the multi-drug resistant strain, as Adam alluded to a few minutes ago, the costs of treatment and the length of treatment suggest that that could cost between two and three hundred thousand dollars per person, um, absent any other resources available to assist. So we were concerned about how to manage that, how to respond to that, and quite honestly, if people who are infected don't have resources through which they, they can seek treatment, there was an obligation on us to protect the community to make that happen. So uh, the state budget was close to being finalized. I think it was in May. We met with Adam. I think you were involved early on as well, Roger, and call was placed to our legislators and uh, Senator Leibum and uh, Representative Lemihue in particular in their role with joint finance, uh, worked with the governor, the department secretary, and their legislative colleagues to seek an emergency allocation within the current state budget to assist Sheboygan County with that effort. There's a TB dispensary allocation that exists within the state budget that we can gain access to. They were able to accomplish an emergency appropriation in that dispensary. I think the final total was about $4.6 million available uh, for our access on an as-needed basis. And so, uh, tremendous assistance on that front. Great relief for us and would otherwise have fallen to our, our levy obligations if everything else had failed. And w we all have, uh, have heard about the problems of the uh, startup with the Obamacare uh, situation, how do you think, uh, if possible, that would help with such as a TB outbreak, or would that not have affected yeah. that? Yeah, so when we talk about the Affordable Care Act, it's a difficult topic to talk about given the way it has started out. And so I can't make any great predictions about what that program will be, <laughs> but when you step back and you look at this situation, 
it does start with health care access. And um, if you're a person and you don't have the means to pay for health care, we know that there's a tendency for people not to seek treatment. And in this example, if you're not seeking treatment, you're now posing risk for the rest of the community. And the costs of that treatment, as I indicated, can be quite extensive. So if you step back again and you just simply understand that there's people out there who have health-related conditions who oftentimes don't have the means of addressing those conditions or oftentimes might wait for them to rise to a crisis level, then they show up in emergency rooms at higher cost for the rest of us, and that translates into insurance premium uh, increases for the rest of the population. As a concept, access to affordable health care makes sense. It's something we should embrace. Now, how that gets delivered is a whole separate matter, so we'll leave it at that. And uh, as we all know, we're entering the uh, flu season. How, how can, uh, what can people do to protect themselves from, from the flu? Sure. Th this flu season is no different than any other. It's now uh, standard annual advisory. Populations at risk should plan to get a flu shot. So what does that mean? Who's at risk? And, that, that includes young children, I think generally between six months and five years of age. That includes pregnant women. That includes other folks with chronic health conditions or uh, immune system deficiencies. That includes persons over age 50. That includes persons who live in long-term care facilities. If you're in any one of those target groups, you are strongly advised to get a flu shot. They're readily available, Roger. Mm -hmm. um, every primary care physician will give you a flu shot. Every walk-in clinic will, will give you a flu shot. Many pharmacies now offer flu shots, and retail outlets that have pharmacies offer flu shots. So there's very few reasons that people can't or shouldn't get a flu shot. Sometimes people say, well, I didn't get one last year and I didn't get the flu, therefore I don't need one. But there's different strains of the flu that emerge each year and the immunizations are intended to respond to those specific strains. Thank you, Tom, and for, uh, for your staff for all the great work you do. Thanks, Roger. Switching gears just a little bit, uh, <clears throat> Roger and the County Board recently adopted a 2014 budget, and as you know, it's a lengthy process, and every department has a role in putting together a department budget, and it's all rolled into the final document. As a component of that 2014 budget, we have a five-year capital plan, and we bond, and we, every year, the board uh, selects projects to invest in, whether it's road construction or putting new roofs on or what have you. And, for 2014, as you know, there was a decision by the board to make a extensive investment in our Health and Human Services building. Yay. Yay. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's fantastic news, not only for our employees there, but, but certainly our clients and guests. And share with our viewers a little bit, well, what's in store for the Health and Human Services Department? Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, I'm very, very excited about that project. Um, we will be adding uh, a new addition to our building by way of a lobby that has certain office capacities built into it. That building we're in was constructed in 1921. As many people know, it has served as the uh, Sheboygan Clinic in its day. And as the clinic operated, I think the, the setup was probably fine. You had a different area that you would go to for dental work, a different area you would go to to see your doctor, different area you would go to for immunizations. And within that kind of setup, different reception points made sense. Now with our unified department configuration, um, one of the main drawbacks of that setup is that we don't have centralized reception. We still have to staff five different spots in that building with receptionists. We don't have a waiting room large enough to accommodate the visitors that we see on a daily basis. There's actually about 250 people that we see on any given day that come to us for various services in a lobby that can accommodate about six or eight folks any point in time. And oftentimes, people entering the building have to trip over those who are otherwise waiting in the lobby in order to get into the interior space. So we'll have a new addition. 
that will offer seating for 25 to 30 folks. We'll have central reception uh, staffed with two receptionists and surge capacity for up to three. We're going to have a couple of exam rooms in that new addition so that when folks present with communicable disease such as TB, one of those rooms is going to be equipped with negative air pressure handling so that we don't risk uh, contamination of others. Um, we're going to have an accessible restroom in that lobby. It's like, why is that a big deal? We have one accessible restroom in the entire building, so uh, to have one available for the public is going to be great. Otherwise, they go to the third floor and the far end of the third floor. Um, we'll have an elevator going up to an upper level with a large meeting room and a break room that staff can gather in and share new ideas and uh, work more closely with each other and a couple of additional restrooms up above. So we're excited about it. I think it'll be tremendous uh, for the people who need services from us. I hope that we can uh, open it up for the community use in general. And it's, it's very, very great to see, appreciate the support we received from you as well as Roger um, in moving that project forward. Well, as you said, 1921, it's a, it's a grand old building, but it was time for some improvements. So mm -hmm. my compliments to you and your leadership on raising awareness to the needs and solidifying support from the county board. You did a wonderful job with that. So looking forward to seeing that those improvements made. We only have about two minutes remaining, but tis the season. We are going to be entering the holidays here soon and cold weather and with cold weather uh, for some people in this community that can make things pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're struggling financially with paying those utility bills or or need to rely on uh, food stamps, what have you. So economic support, one of our four divisions, certainly provides some services in that area. If someone's in need or you know someone's in need uh, during the holidays or during the cold winter months, where do they go to get some help or where do they go to get information? You can get information online for those folks who have access to a computer. Uh, simply do a search for Wisconsin, Wisconsin Home Energy Assistance Program, information on eligibility, et cetera. To apply, people can call our main switchboard number, which is 459-3207. 459-3207. Correct. Very good. Well, thank you. I hope you got a feel for some of the very, very important work that the Health and Human Services Department does, the programs, the services. I think countywide we have about a $126 million budget, and as I mentioned at the onset, $31 million to support key programs and services in Health and Human Services. When I, when I think about county government and the, the, the role that Roger and I have and having kind of our our hands on all 19 departments and having some oversight and leadership roles, but there are some key departments, they're all important, but there are some key departments that really are providing uh, critical services, life-saving services to people in this community. And without question, it's Health and Human Services. It's certainly our, our Sheriff's Department. And uh, again, there are many other important ones, but Health and Human Services tends to pull at many of us because of just how important it is to give that helping hand and get people back on their feet or in the case of a TB outbreak make sure that the rest of this community is safe. So thank you again for joining us today Tom and the important work that your staff do and on behalf of the County Board Chair Roger Distrudi and myself thank you for joining us next month our Highway Commissioner or now Transportation Director, new title, will be joining us to talk about the important roles and responsibilities of the Highway Department and our airport. Until then, thanks for joining us.